those of you who are joining us and hello to uh, everyone else who is watching this recording later on. Uh, I do just want to go over a few technical pieces. So uh, the event today is being live captioned. Uh, if you need to access the captions, you can press the CC button uh, down in your Zoom menu bar. Also throughout the session, uh, we will be uh, using the Q&A function. So if you have a question uh, for our panelists, feel free to go ahead and type it into the Q&A uh, and we'll either answer those throughout or probably have a little bit of time at the end as well to answer those. Uh, we also thank everybody who registered and put in some um, questions or comments or concerns um, in the registration. Um, Corbin and Carrie Ann have uh, woven answers throughout the presentation today. Uh, next, I want to take a moment to uh, do a land acknowledgement and recognize the place that uh, I'm joining you from and where our ASH office sits. So we are in the land currently known as Las Vegas and uh, typically on the UNLV campus, but since March uh, at our kitchen tables and home offices, um, but it is the unceded land of the Southern Paiute. Uh, who are descendants of the Tudinu or desert people who have lived along this region in the Colorado River area uh, since as far back as 1100 AD. Uh, the area, although we think about Las Vegas, actually extends north and west uh, into the area known today as Southern Nevada, Utah, and California. So uh, very much kind of uh, the Grand Canyon area and the Colorado River Basin. We acknowledge that the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, um, and members of the UNLV and ASH communities have and continue to benefit from the use of Southern Paiute land. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn it over to our 2020 program co-chair, Corbin Campbell. Great, well, hello everyone. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are joining us from, uh, but I'm so appreciative that you all are here today to talk with us about uh, what I feel like is often an under um, discussed and underdeveloped um, understanding um, of our discussant role. And, um, and I'm especially uh, appreciative that President Ash President Carrie Ann O'Mara is here to help facilitate this session. And later on, you're going to be hearing from a wonderful group of panelists who I think really bring some of the best of what we would want to the discussant role. And you'll get to hear not only some of what um, we are believe are some strong practices that our discussants can bring to the table, but also from the lived experiences of some who have both been discussed as authors and also served as discussants and have some um, really good tips for how to do um, a, a good service to your authors and to the ASH community in this role. And um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here so that you can see the PowerPoint. Okay, great. So, um, and let me know if the slides are not advancing um, as they should. Uh, just to mention a couple of tips for this webinar. Um, first, uh, if right now there's, um, you would rather have a different view of the speakers, um, you can click the active speaker or the floating layout buttons in the top right of your screen, which will sort of shift um, the way you're able to view, for example, the panelists when they talk later. So that's something good to know. And also, as uh, Jason mentioned before, um, I uh, would ask that you have any, if you have any questions for this um, webinar, please type them into the Q&A um, and you can see that button at the bottom of your screen. And I also wanted to mention that we're going to be referencing a number of different resources um, and also a recording of this webinar will all be um, available on the ASH website and the link is here. So it's always important to start by, um, by talking about the purpose of discussants um, and, and great, I, I just see, I wanted to just note that uh, Jason just put the link for the discussant resources also into the chat so that you can click on that right away and go there um, as well. But always important to start from the beginning. What are we trying to accomplish here? What are we trying to do in the discussant role? And so I would say one of the most important purposes of discussants is to provide deep and constructive feedback to authors on their papers. 
And um, we're gonna talk during this session about the ways in which you as a discussant can do that. Some of that, those issues will be shared at the session in front of the um, attendees, but some of that will be shared more privately to authors um, either before or after the session. And that's a really important part of this practice. Another purpose of the, discussant, of the discussant role is to role model the provision of constructive feedback. So um, for many of you who've been to ASH before and you've sat, in, maybe you haven't served as a discussant before, but you've sat in the audience um, in, a, in a paper session. And I remember for myself when I was a doc student sitting in the audience um, and watching the discussant and hearing the kinds of um, issues that they would bring up about papers and hearing about how they were integrating across papers that it was really role modeling to me the ways in which our field reviews work. Um, so it really serves as that, as that role modeling for our field for how to do good reviewing. And then finally, we hope that our discussants can deepen understanding of the area of study that's presented in this paper session. So although our ASH uh, program um, co-chairs do what I think is an excellent job of trying to pull sometimes disparate papers into good sessions where they really align, it is the work of the discussant to try and bridge those papers in a meaningful way so that the paper session as a whole can advance knowledge in the field. So that integration work, that work to really make the session as a whole have meaning and not just the distinct papers have meaning, that is also part of the purpose of discussants. So what are some of the benefits for serving as a discussant? You all who are here either have agreed to serve as a discussant and so you're interested in, in strengthening that role or perhaps you're just interested in learning about what the discussant role is and maybe you're considering um, whether or not you should volunteer as a discussant. And I do think that there are some really strong benefits to individual scholars in our field for doing this work. And the first one is an educative um, benefit, which is that um, reading authors' papers will give you the opportunity to see the, the newest, most cutting edge research in your area of interest well before it's published. So um, for those of you who've done any reviewing for journals, this is in the same way when you review, when you serve as a discussant at ASH, you'll get the benefit of seeing a full blown paper as, as it's developing. And so, um, so that's, that's a wonderful benefit. It will also hone your ability to give constructive feedback and may support your other roles. If you are a journal reviewer or an editor, um, certainly serving in this discussant role is, is good practice for that and, and, and useful to help hone, hone those skills because you'll be reviewing um, typically three papers as part of your discussant role. And finally, you will certainly make connections with other scholars in your area of interest that can foster future collaborations. And I will say, um, when I served as a discussant, there's sometimes new authors that are coming on the scene in my area that I hadn't had the opportunity to read from. And, and those ended up being uh, future collaborations for, you know, where I know that I've written a book chapter, for example, for um, somebody who edited a collection and I had passed, you know, served as their discussant in the past. I think there's many opportunities for a future collaboration because hopefully these folks will be somewhere in your area. So beyond those individual benefits, those benefits also extend to the field. Um, so so as, as you can imagine, part of this is that you're going to be helping to um, cultivate a good paper, but in that process as discussant, you will hopefully also be developing authors and developing scholars and helping to support the trajectory of those um, of, of those scholars and those authors that you're working with. Um, so, so you'll be able to support not only the scholars, but also the knowledge development within our ASH community. And just as, and it's an individual uh, benefit to create those collaborations, certainly as a field, um, creating those collaborations across scholars that are doing good work in areas is another benefit. And then finally, um, just as uh, doing this work helps you to develop your own skills for constructive reviewing, certainly we're hoping that um, these ASH discussions will go on and continue their service in doing constructive reviews for our journals. And finally, um, certainly we're hoping that in each individual session that has a discussant, the experience in that session is elevated by having a discussant present who can really speak to the most recent work that's happening in that area, 
speak to broader expertise that's happening in that area and make connections so that the folks who are attending that session really feel like they got something meaningful across those papers and across the board um, in that session. So a few resources we're providing to help support discussants in this process. Obviously you're here, we're doing this webinar. That's certainly an important part. And I hope that after um, you, you are a part of this webinar today, that if you know of other discussants, you'll ask them to go uh, to the ASH website to take a look at the webinar in their own time as well. Um, we do have a brief of best practices for discussants that's on that website that you can um, go to that uh, Jason put into the link. And um, there's also the paper presentation guide. And I definitely want to send a, a big thank you and shout out to um, James Hines and, um, and Jason as well, uh, who were very supportive in developing this comprehensive paper presentation guide, um, and, and also to support this webinar and support our best practices. So um, I'll, I'll, in, in just a second, I'll talk a little more about the paper presentation guide and how that will be useful to you. So what do discussants do? Um, first of all, deeply important that you take the, the time to read all papers carefully. And I know that, um, that, that all of us are juggling so many things and especially right now during um, the crises that we are all a part of um, in this moment in time, it just feels like time is so precious and so limited. Um, but deeply reading these papers um, is, is an important part of this, this process. Um, and then providing written comments to authors. Um, in the past, I would say it hasn't always been the, the consistent or 100% of discussants that have provided written, written comments to authors. Sometimes they just presented their comments in the session, but we are asking that all discussants write comments to authors um, privately. So that could be done before or after the session in whatever way you see fit, we're gonna offer some tips today for how to do that, but we are asking all discussants to provide written comments to authors. And the reason is that um, when you're in the middle of that session, taking that feedback, um, it will be so much more constructive for authors to be able to, to read that feedback on their own time. There, there are many things that you may wanna say in writing that you might not wanna say in the session, and we'll talk about that as well. And then the third thing that you'll do is you will give a 10 to 15 minute um, presentation um, of comments during the ASH session um, after the authors have presented their papers. And these comments should both uh, provide constructive feedback to each of the authors on their papers. So you'll be doing that publicly in front of the, um, during the session. Um, but you'll also spend time integrating ideas across the papers and connecting the papers to the broader knowledge of the field on the topic. So during your comments, during those 10 to 15 minutes, and you can imagine if you're discussing three papers, that's not a lot of time, you're gonna need to speak to each of the papers individually, and then also spend time talking about how those papers really do um, connect to broader ideas in the field, connect across each other, and move the field forward in its thinking. So I want to um, so I want to go back and mention as I as I mentioned before um, the Ash office has put together this really helpful um, 2020 Ash 2020 paper session guide and there's a number of really um, helpful pieces of information that relate to discussing and the paper sessions at large but I also want to point out some pieces that I think are especially important to consider as we're thinking about discussing online and I know that there were a number of different questions uh, that came into um, the registration process about discussing online. One of the things I'll just say up front as we were talking about this with the panelists is that none of us have ever done discussing online. So we are all working on this together. And just like many of you have been thrown into teaching online, um, I know that we're all gonna do our best to make this a strong experience. I think that there are a few um, differences that I wanted to mention to you in the technology that I think will help you to prepare how you plan your discussing comments. And so the first one is that, you know, typically when you're in person, there's a number of different ways to interact with your attendees. And some of our discussants have been really creative about how to get um, that interactive element in their discussant comments. Um, but in the, I, I did want to mention that in the, um, in the online way that you'll be interacting in the session, in the window that you're in, you will only be able to see and chat with other presenters and the chair. 
So you will not see uh, the attendees or the chat the attendees are having unless you on a separate screen or a separate window, I should say, on a separate window, go in and actually, you know, go into the session separately as, as an attendee. So if you'd like to see the chat that's going on simultaneously with your session, you're need, going to need to have your presenter window open, your discussant window open, and then separately, you're going to need to have what the attendees would see. And that way you would see the chat. I think in an al alternatively, you could discuss this with your chair ahead of time. Um, and ask them to feed any questions or comments from the attendee window into the presenter window so that the presenters would also see the chat. But I know that, that would, that's something you'll need to talk with your chair about. So I think that is one thing to think about is if you do wanna make it interactive, you'll have to sort of think through those technology pieces. And I wanted to give that um, upfront as something to consider. And I also wanted to pull from the um, ASH 2020 paper session guide that the ASH office put together just um, for those of you who are new to discussing, just the format for um, a typical paper session and how it flows, you'll see here that the chair will introduce each session, um, uh, sorry, each paper. Um, what, and if there's three papers, typically there would be three papers in a session, not always those. So make sure you know that ahead of time um, in terms of changing the, the number of minutes that you have. Uh, but if there's three papers in a session, often those papers will each have 15 minutes to discuss. The chair will introduce each. And then you'll have about 10 to 15 minutes um, to give your discussant comments. And that would come after the three papers are presented and before any Q&A. So that gives you a little sense of the flow. And finally, I will pass it off, uh, not finally, but next I will pass it off to um, ASH President Carrie Ann O'Mara who will talk with us about some of our suggested practices for discussants. Thank you, Corbin. So, um, you know, as you were talking, Corbin, I was thinking about um, some wonderful friends and colleagues that I met in, you know, uh, as part of either being a discussant or who were my discussant um, at ASH. So I believe I met um, Leslie Gonzalez, actually, for the first time at ASH in a room where we both had papers in a session. And I also remember going up to Anna Newman um, and meeting her that way, as well as Amy Trotsky. And so I say that to say, Yes, we're going to be online, um, and so it's going to be a little harder or impossible to physically go up to folks afterwards and say, I just heard your presentation. I, I really um, responded to this. What do you think about that? But please just use, use um, you know, the ability to write somebody an email, um, to use the chat. Just, you know, do the work to, to make sure that those interactions are meaningful you, to you, uh, regardless of the fact that we're online. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to both help folks think about reviewing and the, the, we asked everybody to provide in their peer reviews of the proposals, um, concrete written feedback. And the reason that we're um, trying to, uh, that we are asking all discussants to provide written feedback is to sort of up our game here in terms of um, what we're providing um, uh, in terms of generous thinking to somebody to help um, push their work forward, right? To, to, to really advance. And that'll be better if we get very concrete feedback. Um, and, and that, of course, the idea of generous thinking builds on um, Chris Wren's um, work, um, you know, that basically says, you know, what was the intention of this? And so whether is, is it meeting that intention or not? And what could I do to sort of um, help it move forward? We also want to be, uh, be humble and recognize that we might be coming at the piece from um, from uh, you know, an identity or an epistemology or a, a method that we use that is not um, the same as the paper and be humble and open to those different epistemologies um, that are reflected in those pieces and really think about the intentions of the authors um, when shaping those, your comments. So um, some big uh, considerations to think about. Um, you know, the, the first one is people raise, well, okay, what should I say publicly versus privately, right? In your written comments that you're gonna give just to the authors versus the things that you say. So in general, you wanna provide publicly broad, constructive, reinforcing comments, um, you know, things that um, might complement the piece or, you know, might talk about its importance. Um, whereas you're gonna save things like on page 23, uh, you didn't reference one of the bigger people in this field. Um, you're gonna save that kind of comment 
um, for your written comments. It's something somebody needs to know because you're sort of um, preventing reviewer two syndrome, right? Which is that the, you're being this, you're this opportunity to let somebody know what reviewers will later say when it's submitted to a journal. So it is important to provide that feedback if somebody really missed the mark on something in the paper, but that's the kind of thing that you can do in your, in your writing. Um, but you know, the, the idea is not to, is basically to present things that are more uh, bigger scale and integrative. So what are some um, specific uh, comments for providing deep and constructive feedback? Um, you know, one of the, one of, you can do a, a variety of things. So one is you might do track changes in your written comments so that you can, you know, particularly point to specific things, but we're really open to how you provide that written feedback. Um, you might uh, actually like to print it out and make comments throughout and um, scan that in and send it to somebody. Um, but basically, you're thinking like a reviewer, right? So is this, and, and so you think about the kind of thing that our journals would, would say or our book presses, um, you know, is the, the writing clear and is it well organized? Did you know where it was going? Were there signposts along the way? Um, did they do a, an appropriate review of the literature or the theory base? Or if it's grounded theory, was that clear, right? Um, in the section on methods, depending on the method, do you see all the things that uh, somebody reviewing qualitative work or quantitative work and, and other from other um, methodologies would be looking for to see that they that, that this was you know done in a rigorous um, kind of a way? Um, and then when when they interpret the findings from the study. Um, are they believable? Do you feel like those findings um, link well to both the nature of the data they had and the questions they asked? And then when they they interpret for you what they mean, um, you know, do you, are you in agreement or do you feel like they overreached what their actual data is and what it said? Um, and so all of those things, and remember compliments are good too. So it's not only critique of when they missed the mark, but it's also, boy, this is a fantastic data source. Um, I really see the concrete implications of your findings. Um, that's also helpful too, because you're reflecting back to the, the, um, the authors, you know, the best parts of their study, the real strength. That can also help them choose journals later, because it might be that they went into the creation of the paper thinking, oh, this is the best thing about this is actually the theory when you think it's the uniqueness or the distinctiveness of the database. Um, and that might affect where they where they send it. So think about those kind of things. Um, again, focus on the author's intentions. Um, you know, I think I already uh, just went over all these things, Corden. <laughs> yeah. So try to think of a sandwich strategy. Um, people like to hear uh, what their paper did uh, best at the beginning, and then think about um, you know the degree to which. Uh, it could be improved and then closed with things that you think are particularly promising. That sandwich approach is um, nice to hear and, and helps people who are sitting nervously in the audience worried about what the critique is going to be um, to hear those things on either end. Um, focus on big picture issues when you're trying to connect the, the papers, um, either things in the news or, or timely, things that connect because of across um, a particular theory or something about the, the methods that speaks to each other within the papers. Um, and, and again, you are a role model. You are role modeling for um, within, our, within our community um, how to uplift work and not tear it down and to critique in ways that advance it. So just be aware of that as you're preparing your comments. Um, and so, um, you know, I, th I think we also just wanted you to think more broadly across the papers about the state of research in that area. So has this person touched on an area that's rarely studied or rarely used with this kind of data? Um, you know, what are some things that, that tie them together? Those are good things to do to sort of integrate the work uh, toward the end of your comments. Um, you know, another way to approach that are the things that it makes you wonder about, um, about what could be studied next with what data sources or whether a particular theory would be more useful in, in where this area is going. Um, also, um, when you're making your comments, this is totally up to you, but we have seen some um, discussants figure out a way to ask a question um, that perhaps people could respond to in the chat or um, in interacting during the question and answer session. Um, so for example, if you get to the end of the, um, 
the presentation is your discussion session, the chair opens it up for questions. Um, you might actually pose a question to get them commenting as opposed to just asking questions if there's sort of silence there. Now, there's some things we don't want you to do. Obviously, um, we were talking uh, among the panel about the fact that unfortunately, many of us remember a discussion session in the past where somebody was really torn, you know, the, the, the process sort of tore down the paper, right? Um, maybe by pointing out to specific edits that were not helpful and needed to be said in the, uh, the larger group, um, suggesting to somebody that you didn't cite me, uh, not good form, not particularly helpful. Um, so, you know, we don't want you remember uplift, your role modeling, uh, generous thinking, what was the intention of this work? Where do you think it's headed in terms of publication? And, um, you know, how do you help that happen? Um, also, we, we all have to live with the reality that sometimes two papers are more aligned than the third. Um, and the fact that sometimes material comes in in different stages it's usually not that helpful to um, dwell on those facts, but rather to kind of work with what you have um, and make the best of it rather than um, sort of talking about, oh, I wish these three papers were more aligned or, um, you know, I'm disappointed this piece wasn't further along. Um, and also to try to sort of co-opt the paper and say, this is what this studied, but I wish it had studied that um, because you want to work with what the intention of the author was, not where you have a great idea <laughs> that you can take it. And that's different from saying be integrative and look at the state of the field. I know there's like a fine line there, but um, do you think about what the author wants to study and help them advance on their path? All right, and here's some, old, some resources that Corbin mentioned that are uh, going to be available to you um, and you see the links for here. And now we want to turn to our really awesome panel. And we will ask them to turn their um, video on. And I'm so excited that we were asked some, able to ask some fantastic um, discussions to do some reflection on three questions that we have for you, um, Eddie, Gina, and Susan. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm gonna start with Eddie. I'm gonna um, join the first question and, and just ask you to get us started if it's okay. Um, so, you know, we've talked about this this person sitting nervously in the uh, audience thinking, oh, what's the discussant going to say, sort of cringing, like getting their body language is tough. And, you know, um, I, I'd like you to, you know, think back on a time when perhaps you were in that seat or you were watching somebody else feel that way. And then the discussant came on and really, um, you know, found a way to tie the work together or to suggest to somebody something that was really important in terms of advancing that work. In other words, took that moment from, oh no, I'm bracing for the terrible thing they're gonna say about my work and embarrass me. And then it actually turned into this really fantastic moment where they either gained something from the discussant for their paper or mm -hmm. everyone in the room sort of got something from the way in which the discussant tied it together. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great opening question. I'm glad to tackle it. And I'll give a personal example. So myself, let me just say my comments will be um, as a historian of higher education. Um, so I'm thinking from that perspective. And I, I want to name Tim Kaine at the University of Georgia, um, who's just a phenomenal uh, citizen of Ash and just a very thoughtful scholar. And so I had a paper uh, that was in the early stages of my book development uh, that I was using at Ash. And uh, we were in a session called um, Higher Education Discourse in Critical Historical Moments. And so there was my paper on college presidents' responses to race historically. There was another one about the entrepreneurial university um, and uh, community colleges. The third one was about community college history. Uh, obviously, seemingly three very different aspects of higher education history, but the way he was able to make connections across these three papers uh, still stands out to me. It's just phenomenal. And for me personally, he helped me connect my work understanding college presidents and race historically uh, to understanding the Cold War and the expansion of higher education uh, alongside these college presidents. I mean, it's absolutely excellent to make these sort of, to have this push. And so just how he was able to, uh, you know, thread a needle between uh, these three topics that, again, seemed like they were so distant from each other, uh, that still stands out as just 
great modeling around what a discussant should do. And then he asked some broader questions. And I think it's important to mention this because he asked about reactions to, you know, sort of societal reactions to the college presidents that I was studying and snippets to how other college presidents engaged with the one I was focused on. And so in reflecting on my own experience, I think it was most important to understand his role in how one discusses a paper, what you just mentioned, right? So it's one thing to say, I didn't do this. It's another thing to simply pose questions for me to consider and push my thinking that way. Uh, hands down, uh, I think that's one of the most, um, you know, the best example of a discussion that I've had. And I've learned to model my own discussion uh, roles that I, I have several since then uh, after what I experienced that I really removed the nervousness about working through a new topic and really pushed my thinking to see how it connected with other scholars. Thank you, Eddie. That's fantastic. And, and especially the, I really love what you said about um, posing questions as a way to advance somebody's thinking, but also what you were saying about the Cold War content. Like when someone introduces you to a set of um, you know, to a context that you hadn't been including, but you later realize is really relevant as an interpretation. They are, that is a, another way that discussions are really, really powerful. Um, Susan, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for your service. I think the role of a discussant is so important and um, I love being a discussant. I love even more being in the presence of a great discussant. And I think the slides that Carrie Ann and Corbin presented are really useful. If you follow all of those, you'll be in great shape. Okay, I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so in reflecting on the question that was posed, I, I have to share a story that it made me think back to, I once heard a woman college president say that her definition of a great leader was somebody who could tell you to go to hell, but make you think you'd enjoy the trip. So I don't mention that flipply, but I tie it into the role of discussant because to get at the idea that Corbin and Carrie Ann introduced, um, the ability to give deep and constructive feedback uh, is um, maybe sounds easy, but it is a really challenging um, balancing act. I take really, really seriously my role as a discussant to be a champion of individual papers, as well as to help the audience um, see the connections across papers. So um, I always approach, um, and similar to Eddie, I had some really good discussants uh, whose work I modeled, and I could tell that those individuals had read my paper really, really carefully. And they helped me to see things that I hadn't seen before um, and to ask questions of my paper that I hadn't considered, but ultimately made um, the paper much better in the end. Um, and so there is an element of constructive feedback that sometimes is hard as the presenter to take in, similar to when you get a review from a a journal um, that doesn't go the way you'd hoped it to. It's sort of like a dagger in your heart. Um, but uh, a good reviewer also points out all the strengths um, and the potential of a paper. And again, helps you to see um, something that, that you might have missed. Um, so when I um, think about a good discussant, I um, think about somebody who actually writes another paper. It's like a bonus round um, in ASH because you learn about those, you learn more about those individual papers because the good discussant helps you see things in those papers that you might not have considered. Um, of course, uh, as a journal, as an editorial board member, you sometimes have the benefit of anonymity that you don't have um, in, in presenting comments um, and that's where I think just great care is always needed in how you frame the points that you wanna make. Um, and again, I kind of go back to this idea of being a champion. I think of um, my role as a discussant as being a champion of individual papers. So I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Susan. I, as you were talking about, I love that idea of um, they'll take you to hell, but, <laughs> but you'll, they'll convince you you love the ride. Um, I, I'm reminded of um, a story of a colleague who every time they got a revise and resubmit that was particularly critical, 
they had a chair like the one I'm in now that rolls back and forth and they would they would print it out um, olden time obviously printed out but and they would stick it on the bottom on the floor and they would run over it back and forth back and forth just to get out the 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 anger or the frustration about the the big um, sort of hill they had to climb you know to to get it back to the journal but what I think you're saying is that the the um, the discussant is helping you like you know a quarter mile up that hill like they're, they're not only telling you where you need to be at the bottom of that hill, but they're also like getting you on the path to start back up the hill again. And, and that's just incredibly generous. So Gina, I wanna welcome you and, and get your comments too. Okay, thank you all for inviting me to be here. I'm actually gonna say something before I get into the actual question. I'm gonna talk about this idea of being virtual discussants. Cause as I'm sitting here, I'm like, my lighting is so bad. I need one of those O's, <laughs> right? Like people have those circle lights and I see them like on Instagram and you can't see the light when people are talking, but I guess it's behind them. I don't know where it's at, but something to think about as this virtual discussion is like your lighting. Cause I'm like, this lighting is really bad um, at this time of day. So like our lighting, what's behind us, those are all things to think about as you think about discussing. I also should have put a necklace on. So we have to think about very different things as virtual discussion. So that's something, you know, to consider. Um, um, and I haven't been a discussant at a, at a virtual conference either. So I'm excited to do it um, and learn this platform too. As far of, as the question, as I think about, um, and I want to talk about different, I don't want us all to say, you know, talk about the same thing. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a discussant that like, that made me feel like I was super smart and amazing. And it was when I was in a, I was a doctoral student. Um, I wrote this paper. It was a conceptual paper. Um, it was for CEP. I remember it was a, C, a CEP space. It was about minority serving institutions broadly. Um, and I was writing about Hispanic serving institutions. And so the papers tied together well, but the discussant did a lot of validating of me. Like I remember that feeling of like really making me feel like I was onto something, like giving me really just affirmations for what I was thinking about. And it was a conceptual paper. So it was a lot of like, these are great ideas. Did you think about this? And then, um, brought us together in a way in the discussion that was like okay well this paper what about like did, like gina can you answer that question like the the, the discussion was connecting us in really interesting ways throughout the discussion rather than focusing primarily on here's how i see the tying together but actually was was having like asked me to con consider the other paper right like well you're kind of doing that too what do you think about that paper um and i think that was that was powerful because it I, it remember i remember feeling a Affirmed, right? That I was smart, right? Like I was like, oh, I'm smart. I'm writing something that people care about, right? And that's hard at Ash, especially when you're a doc student that you're like, everyone's going to think I am dumb. I don't know what I'm doing. I shouldn't even be here. Imposter syndrome, all of that kicks in. And it just was such an affirming space that like I was really validated. So I can't remember exactly what they said. I just remember the feeling. And so I think that's something important to think about is like, this isn't a space where we tear people down. It actually is a space where we want to build people up and affirm them. And even if the papers are totally disconnected, doesn't mean we can't say like really positive things, even if the paper has a lot of feedback, right? That's separate. And I know that we're gonna talk about that next. So I'll, I'll stop there. Cause I think that's important, right? To distinguish what we say versus other feedback. Gina, thank you so much for that. And, you know, I'm so glad you made that point about um, how you felt validated and how you felt kind of uplifted, because that is the whole point of this, right? I mean, <laughs> we've got lots of ways that the world is tearing people down right now and making them invisible and um, not honoring their voices and uh, erasing them. And that is not our space. That is not our values. That is not who we want to be. Um, but that feeling that you had about being validated is really important. And uh, I should let the um, folks know that we, we did ask our, um, our panelists to try to focus more on these good experiences than any experience they would have had where they felt torn down because we don't want to dwell there. We all know they have happened, but we are moving forward <laughs> and uh, really trying to recreate, um, you know, strengthen the space. Um, so with that in mind, let's get concrete about the kinds of things you choose to put in the writing to someone. So, you know, your comments in track changes or just say maybe it's two paragraphs in an email if it's broader comments. Um, in the written comments versus things you would bring up in a session and whoever wants to go first. Maybe Susan, Susan will go first. 
Oh gosh. All right. Thank you. I saw Gina going for it. I was like, ah, nope. <laughs> um, well, I just want to reiterate um, the importance of providing written feedback and distinguishing between what you share publicly and what you provide privately. So I think I said that without saying a negative comment, right? Like, do this. It's a really good thing. It's really helpful. Um, what I do, uh, my process is, um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I literally think about my discussant comments as writing a paper. And what I put in that paper are um, the comments that I'm going to make publicly. Uh, what I want to um, emphasize as strengths of the paper, what I think of as the contributions that the paper makes. Um, I might include or I will include comments that um, may be more broadly oriented in terms of conceptually, did you consider or you might consider um, that uh, then in notes that I, a, a separate document um, that I create for each presenter, each paper author, I might push those comments a little bit further. I might be more direct, like uh, in publicly, I might say, um, you might consider um, thinking about the concept of X. And then in the um, comments that would go to the author privately, I might provide um, some further clarification about what I mean by that. Um, I also think that um, papers that require um, another round of editing or proofreading, I don't think of those comments as appropriate to make publicly, um, but I will often return a paper with track changes uh, as though I'm grading a paper, for example, as a faculty member. So making edits, making comments in margins, um, that kind of thing. So um, I, again, I think the principle that I operate from is that when I'm providing public comments, I'm providing comments to the authors, but also to a larger audience. And so um, I want my comments to be useful to both the authors of the papers, but also in ways that's gonna be helpful to those in the audience who came to, to hear a particular paper. Um, uh, so yeah, I think those are the, um, the ways that I approach it and the reality of kind of really constructing two documents for every um, paper author. Thank you, Susan. That, that reminds me, the questions that you posed and the way you pose them, um, I, I really think opens possibilities for people. So rather than you're saying, you asked the wrong questions, <laughs> you're saying, you know, your, your questions made me think of these questions too, and not either or. And so I really like that approach. Um, Gina, would you go next? Yes. Um, I do some similar stuff that Susan mentioned um, as far as providing changes. I usually ask for a Word document. People will often send PDFs and I do ask for a Word document in case I want to just do, or not revisions. I don't necessarily do edits or revisions, but like can do comments, right? Like comment on a whole section. Um, but I've done both where I provide comments back it directly in the paper and also just written it out. Um, and I think of that more as like uh, when I review for a journal, right? Like I would write it all out and then provide feedback in like the system, right? The um, journal feedback system. And I wouldn't necessarily do it within the document. It's more like intro, here's some feedback, here's some feedback on the lid or the conceptual framework method, stuff like that. Um, so I've done it both ways. Um, but I, uh, too, you know, definitely it's, it's completely different what you talk about versus what you provide the feedback. Um, I often joke, everybody jokes about reviewer two and I'm like, I think I'm reviewer two. I always worry that I'm reviewer two. I've told people, I think I'm reviewer two. And people are like, no, you're not reviewer two. Reviewers two, two is me. And I'm like, but what if reviewers two is really just constructive, right? What if reviewer two is good? Um, because they're pushing your thinking. And so I do a lot of that. I feel like I do a lot of that, but I try not to be mean um, about it, but constructive, right? And there is a fine line with that too. I think in all of this we're talking about, there's a fine line between constructive and making you feel good about it versus this is terrible, right? So it's not that, it's more like, you know, 
just constructive feedback. Um, and so I try to give good constructive feedback. Um, but then in the paper or in the session, the talking is not about the paper feedback. It's about the connection between papers, the affirmations, this is great, you know, maybe did you consider this kind of questions, but um, um, but not like that the the I wouldn't ever read the exact feedback right during the during the presentation right that's for the person. Um, I try to give the feedback before the session and I've had people work comment about that that they're like i've never got you get a lot of i've never gotten feedback before which I don't think is true, I think a lot of us do get feedback. Um, but there are some folks that don't ever actually give. Uh, paper feedback. So I will encourage everybody listening, please give feedback. People will will thank you. Like people come running up to me like, I can't believe you gave me feedback. I didn't think I was going to get feedback. Um, so they really, really appreciate it um, and take that feedback, you know, as they're, as they're going into reviewing. So please do provide anything. Please affirm that you got the paper and you read it because it, it does matter to people. Um, but it wouldn't be the same as what you talk about in the session. Yes, and um, Gina, we are requiring that all the discussions provide feedback this time, like we did the um, that they write in the box with uh, peer reviews. And so, um, you know, it is a, a commitment that you're making an investment in each other by agreeing to be in a, um, a discussion to provide that written feedback and for exactly the reason that you just said. And, you know, let me just, um, <laughs> you know, I joked about reviewer two, too. And we need reviewer two. I'd much rather meet reviewer two at Ash in a paper session than when I've submitted something to the Journal of Higher Ed and meet reviewer two there. That's one of the things that is the you know benefit of your membership and, and being part of the association that, especially when you know that's gonna come up. Like it's one thing if it's like, I wonder if people will have an issue with this later, but if you know that there's some big thing that is really gonna maybe even get them a desk reject later, Right, um, and then to not mention it in the written comments. I mean, you know, that's malpractice. You want to get you want to get that person that information so that they can um, be ahead of the game. Um, Eddie, if you can go next. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with Susan and Gina. It's not much more to add, right? There's the very specific things that you say uh, privately, directly to the authors. Uh, but the the one thing I say, my approach to as I speak to the audience, and I love that Susan brought this up is that um, it's just as important to um, use the author sort of as a through way to have a broader conversation with everyone in attendance. That's critical. And uh, oftentimes I approach being a discussant in a sort of freestyle manner live because I treat it like teaching because there's so many more details in the actual papers when you actually read the papers than the authors will ever present on. And so sometimes you, you're not quite sure in your prepared comments what the authors would emphasize or not emphasize, but sometimes they'll bring up something that I didn't anticipate them to share with the entire audience. And then I have to make a note in real time to comment on that and help contextualize that for the audience as well. Because I imagine as you know, anything with Ash, we choose which sessions to go to based on our interests. So my assumption is there are people who are watching that also are writing on similar topics or adjacent topics. And so again, just as if you were in the classroom teaching, uh, trying to push, make connections from what the authors have said to what other people are thinking, um, just in the full context of everybody tuned in and particularly in the Zoom format, but even in general, when we're in person. So that's the one thing I would add and sort of taking real time notes and being sure to emphasize uh, particular comments um, on the spot so everybody can bring it all together. Thank you, Eddie. And um, I love that point that you just made about freestyle or, you know, sort of being flexible. I, I definitely have been a discussant when there was just some part of the paper I wasn't understanding or it wasn't sticking with me, I didn't get. And I made a comment um, to talk about that. And then the person presented it and it was uh, in one slide completely answered the question. So if I hadn't been paying attention, then I would have made this comment and everybody in the audience and the reviewer had been like, what? You know, the, the author been like, I just explained that and it's very clear. And, and so um, that idea of tuning in, sometimes the audience might ask a question later in the discussion that also reveals, you know, you, that might create some um, engagement. So that's fantastic. So um, we just have a few minutes left, but I, I wanna, um, the, the third question that we had for each of you 
we should just think about if there's anything you haven't said yet that um, you'd like to share about how you enact, um, you know, how you prepare for and your process as a discussant. So anything else that you had thought to share that we were not covered in the previous questions about enacting this role? And I think I'll ask Gina to go first because I'm rotating. <laughs> Um, I one time I was really highly motivated and I prepared PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I I don't think I've done that since. That might have been my first time, uh, but I think it it you know you can do those kind of things, right? It's like you can then be a presenter too. And the PowerPoint slides address each slide address the papers. There was like a conceptual slide of like here's how I think they all come together, and then there's some other um, things to consider. So you know I think we can think outside the box like that. Like you don't have to just show up and be all like you know like taking your like your your notepad and, and giving feedback um so that was probably the most innovative i've i've ever innovative thing i've ever done um in being discussant maybe i'll do it this year <laughs> well it's another way in which you showed that you know you were taking that role really seriously and uh th not that that's the only way to do that but but that is one signal you were sending by by preparing that way so that's really cool um let's see i don't remember if susan or eddie goes next so susan <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, I think maybe what I would just say, and it's been implied, I think, in everything that we've said, is that uh, the role it takes time um, to do a good job. So it's for me, it's it can't be a last minute endeavor. I read every paper multiple times. I read them like as an individual paper. I read them across the papers. Um, so uh, I think to do a good job, you need to make sure that you allocate a good chunk of time. And then the last thing I would just say is that um, I think the overarching principle that I use is that uh, is to think about um, what would be what kind of discussant would I want um, in terms of uh, what will be most helpful for me in terms of strengthening the work that I'm doing. So I think about ash papers as how can I help this person move to the next step, submitting for a journal or whatever their um, ultimate goal for the paper might be. So always from the spirit of, of helpfulness. I love that. And that's one of the reasons we invited you to be a, <laughs> a panelist as you read it like five times. And um, we know the effort that you put into it. And you know, I wanna mention one thing related to that. At one point, the program committee thought about um, sort of asking our, our uh, authors, and we, we didn't get to this, but might be something that might happen in the future, their intention for the paper after. In other words, sometimes it's a policy report or it's a future change magazine article, or it's a review of higher ed. And the default is always, we think this is at least, um, you know, in paper sessions, we often think, well, this is on its way to a journal article, but it could be that it's on its way to something else and they signal that to you. So if, if that's signaled to you, then um, helping that person to make it an even stronger policy report, of course, makes more sense than just assuming it's on its way to the, to the review of higher ed. And so that um, listening, that sort of uh, listening to what their intention was is really awesome. Um, Eddie. Yeah, the, the one thing I'd add, and I love the, the, the intentionality around taking time to do it, not please don't wait until a few days beforehand. Uh, but it, the one thing I'd add is uh, I try to, once I look at the title of the papers, uh, it, as soon as they come in, I always in the back of my mind as I read the papers, constantly ask myself, what does this session mean for the field? Um, so I, I actively think about what the theme is for the overall conference. Um, I try to think of what pressing societal issues are going on in the moment. And then because I'm usually tacked onto a, a history session, uh, that means that I get a chance to talk about just how critical history is to understanding our present. And so I try to, uh, you know, just thinking back my mind, what do I want to convey when reading across these papers about the importance of whatever the papers are, whatever the topics are to our field and trying to convey that importance to the authors. I think that really speaks to Gina's point about, you know, really validating them as scholars that they're doing important work and that they're, they're important to, you know, what we're trying to accomplish as Ash but also just who they are as individual scholars. Thank you, Eddie. That was fantastic. And boy, you three are absolutely amazing at covering different things and yet um, they're, they're all connected. That was really phenomenal. I was thinking um, 
about, as Eddie, you were speaking about uh, the, the bigger landscape and trying to connect the theme, you know, why is this important right now kind of a thing. That is very validating. I completely agree. Um, whether you're tying it to a policy that's up, you know, um, for consideration nationally or budget cuts or diversity, um, equity and inclusion on a campus, like tying it to, to things we all know are, are present and that we care about um, is another way of validating. I, I was also thinking that I got some, I've been getting a lot of feedback uh, recently um, in preparation for the presidential talk at ASH. And um, one, of the, one of the pieces of feedback that I got that was especially helpful was somebody saying, okay, I understand what you're saying this is, but what is it not? Like put some boundaries around it, right? Like, is it ever, you know, is the concept, um, I was talking about the concept of discretion well, is everything discretion? You know, where are the limits or the boundaries of the thing that you're you're talking about? And it was really helpful because it, it helped me to further um, narrow in on the concept and explain it in a, a more concrete way. And so that's an example of these queuing questions that folks can ask that are sort of like, I see you're saying this, but could you show me, you know, either its relationship to national events or um, can you sort of create the scope? sort of like in a methodology class, like Susan, like, you know, what's the scope of your, your case study or what's the extent of your, um, of what you're studying. So I'm gonna invite uh, Corbin back on so that we can, um, both of us just thank our, our panelists together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> this is so wonderful to hear, um, you know, just great examples of the way that we're hoping to build up our scho the scholars and the scholarship in our field. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, and so you have all those resources available. I'll invite Jason back on to see if there's anything else he would like to share as we close our webinar. No. Okay. So you've got all those resources. Go to it. Uplift our members. Um, I want to thank Jason and the ASH um, staff for all their support of this webinar. I want to thank our panelists. Um, have a great day, and we look forward to seeing you at the virtual 2020 conference. Thank you. Thank you all.